Welcome, everyone. I'm Jen Lansford, a research professor at the Sanford School of Public Policy and at the Center for Child and Family Policy. Before introducing our guests, I have a few words about logistics. Welcome, I'm, everyone. I'm Jen Lansford, a research professor at the Sanford School of Public Policy and at the Center for Child and Family Policy. Before introducing our guests, I have a few words about logistics. I will be moderating a discussion among our panelists for this session. If you have questions for the panelists, please put them in the chat and we'll get them toward the end of the session. You may submit questions via the hop in chat function at any time during the presentation. So welcome to our session on Centering Family Voices. We've heard this morning that shifting both the policy and popular mindset toward one that recognizes and responds to the universal needs and aspirations of all parents requires new approaches to engaging and listening to families. There was a lot of um, chatter in the, ch um, the chat function um, during the last session about this issue. So I'm excited to be able to delve into that now. If we want to re avoid repeating the mistakes of previous generations, we need to make room at the table for new voices and perspectives, those who have not historically had the power to influence the creation of policies and programs. This is not always easy and takes dedication and the ability to reimagine the way we work. I am honored to be joined by three women who are committed to lifting up family voices and are leaders in developing strategies for how to center family voices in their organization's work. Amanda Klein is joining us from Illinois where she's the director of the National Center on Parent, Family and Community Engagement. She brings over 25 years of experience as an early childhood administrator and advocate. She's a former migrant and seasonal Head Start director and the founding executive director of the National Migrant and Seasonal Head Start Association. Her prior work gives her a rich national perspective and deep knowledge of both early childhood systems across the nation and of state-specific challenges that shape policy, regulation, and cross-system communication. Manda is a native Texan and a graduate of Sh uh, Shriner University. She's a graduate of the Center for Public Service at Texas Tech University and holds a master's in public administration. Sophia Jackson joins us from North Carolina, where she's the chief strategy officer for the North Carolina Partnership for Children. Ms. Jackson's work focuses on strengthening the connections among the early learning sector, the home visiting parenting education sector, and the health, child health sector. She's dedicated to ensuring that learning environments, community organizations, and policy decisions are responsive to families with young children and promote optimal child development. With master's degrees in early childhood education and administration in school psychology, Ms. Jackson is a passionate early childhood leader working to close the gap between what is known and what is offered along the birth to five continuum. Dr. Twyla Dillion is the executive director of Health Connect One and has over 10 years of experience in the nonprofit sector spanning philanthropy, Medicaid reform, maternal child health, data analytics, and academia. Her research is focused on breastfeeding, maternal child health programs, and collaborating with Black moms to better understand um, contributors to Black maternal mortality and morbidity and develop strategies for better outcomes. As a Black woman leader, Dr. Dillian is committed to promoting, cultivating, collaborating with, and embodying leadership reflective of the Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities often served by the nonprofit sector. So to start us off, um, Twyla, what does it mean to center family voices and how do you center family voices in your work? Thanks, Jennifer. I'm happy to be with all of you today. Um, at Health Connect One, as, I meant, as you may already know, we train, mobilize, and connect communities in service of birth equity. So actually, we are family. That saying, the folks that we work with are the families. They represent the families. They're part of the families that we also serve. So workforce development within communities that are going to be impacted most by our programming is something that we're committed to at Health Connect One and maintaining relationships and ongoing dialogue around how to best serve those communities. That phrase, those that are closest to the challenge or also closest to the solution is something that we live. You know, we know that this is true. People who are most impacted by systems and policies are rarely centered in their development. Thus, it's no surprise that many of the issues that we've been trying to solve for decades still persist. Models where something is being done to a community to solve a problem should be replaced with those that are partnering authentically with communities to create and iterate on solutions, because what's the solution today may not well be the solution tomorrow. Centering family voices in the development of systems, programs, and policies is a more likely way to establish equitable approaches, and that's why we do, that, do our work in the way that we do. Models that are community-based, 
like the ones that we provide at Health Connect One, engage community members as partners, thereby ensuring constant feedback from people with lived experiences that are shared with those they serve. During the pandemic, solutions, or we're still kind of in the pandemic, but at the height of the pandemic, solutions that were appropriate and timely took center stage. Uh, however, this work should always be the way, knowing that we want to make sure that the voices of the people who are going to be most impacted by policies, programs, where the dollars are going, are really in the middle of all of that work, not having something coming down from above to be done to them. So that's basically how we do it <laughs> over at Hill Connect One, um, making sure that we've got families at the table in the, the folks that are actually being trained to provide support to their communities and in the folks who are on staff uh, at Health Connect One as well. Thank you. Thank you, good answer. Um, can I open up the question to you, um, Sophia and Amanda? How do your organizations center family voices? Sure. Sophia, do you want me to go first? Yes, you found the mute button before me. <laughs> um, well, Centering Family Voice is about understanding parents and, and caregivers having the clearest perspective of what families need from their own lived experiences. And at the National Center on Parent, Family, and Community Engagement, we are focused on families and supporting the Head Start programs across the country um, through training and technical assistance. We know that parents know better than anyone how and why programs and policies fall short and what changes would improve outcomes. We believe that increasing and centering family voice helps support better outcomes for children. Um, we actually are championing, building, and strengthening ongoing structures that embed bi-directional bi communication among families engaged in the early childhood systems with providers, advocates, and system leaders. Some of the ways that we actually center family voice are by respecting and elevating families as experts. And this is something that has been tried and true in Head Start. We have always really supported that parents coming to the table and being part of the, the programmatic and policy um, structure at Head Start. We support authentic partnerships between families and staff provide families with opportunities for personal and professional growth and development. So many, we just had a, um, an institute last week and we had so many staff who were former Head Start parents um, coming in and sharing their experiences about their children and their children's growth and their own professional growth by being part of the Head Start program and going on to get their CDA or their AA to be in the classroom, or we had a number of staff who were are now family service advocates themselves, having been a parent in the program previously. We know that that happens with enable, by enabling meaningful and sustained engagement of families, and that's something that Head Start has has been, um, it's, it's been about from the very beginning of the program. And then we want to intentionally include parents with diverse experiences um, so that they can help us find solutions. I loved the quote that, um, that Twyla led with, um, the closest to the challenge are also the closest to the solution. I believe that to be very true. And we've never known that more than we did during the pandemic. Um, and as we're hopefully starting to move out of it, the lessons that we've learned um, throughout this process in really bringing families forward and bringing those voices forward are going to help us be better for it on the other side of it. We, as I was explaining, we just had a, an institute last week where we had over 6,000 people registered and thousands came and joined us each day. Um, and we talked a lot about how um, we are, we at the National Center are centering family voice in our work. We saw parents and, and parents that were previous, um, that are now staff members engaging in this work. They are taking those authentic partnerships and really moving that voice forward. And so really when we think about centering that, it really, it truly means that right in the middle that families are a part of the work that we're doing, providing guidance, whether we're creating a resource. Um, it's not I think years ago it was like, well, did the parents see that? And it was a document that had already been prepared and presented to them. Now it's like, have the parents been a part of that? And they are part of those processes that are really helping us be better on the front end so that on the other side of these, um, whatever they are, resources, documents, supports, um, that their voice has been um, 
really clear throughout. Thanks, right. Mindy. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, so um, on behalf of the Smart Start Network, it's exciting to think about um, being a part of 75 organizations across the state of North Carolina that are engaging families in a continuum of ways, in a continuum of roles. Back in 2019, there was um, a large statewide effort to define a family engagement uh, framework that would guide organizations um, across the state in understanding the importance of centering family voices, what it looks like in action. And we describe our continuum as like kind of three major steps along the way where families are first involved as recipients in programs. So excited that we named family engagement first by just being involved and reaching families and partnering with them as recipients. Um, moving along the continuum, we define it as engagement where families and parents operate as consultants and partners in ways to strengthen our, plan our planning processes and our implementation. And then at the furthest end of that continuum, we have uh, the leadership part of it, where families are acting as change agents. And it's been amazing to partner and work with organizations that are really leaning into various parts of that continuum um, and also looking at how that continuum um, and various uh, families really work together. Let me share a story with you out of one of our counties where they have literally engaged on that full spectrum of recipients and consultants and leaders in their community. Um, our county, one of our counties in North Carolina, Randolph County, and our local partnership um, worked with family leaders to present to county commissioners about the need for community navigators and seven public libraries. Through those stories, the county commissioners were inspired and they were able to secure $250,000 annually to support this effort. So we see family leaders advocating the city officials to say, um, these resources are needed on behalf of families. With those additional dollars, they have hired one community navigator. We're excited to follow that work. And what those family navigators are doing are providing access and information to families so that we can increase the pool of recipients that are participating in available services. And then eventually moving and working with them along the continuum um, as they, would see, as they would see as consultants or leaders. Uh, similar to what Twyla mentioned in the beginning, the focus of family engagement and leadership is our, in our network and across the state. We have this mantra that says nothing for us without us, replacing doing to with doing with. And, and we really recognize that in order to realize significant outcomes for children, um, we must be able to create spaces for those receiving the services to actually influence and develop those services. A couple other cool examples about how our network is engaging um, and centering family voice. Um, in one county, we have family leaders collaborating with um, um, NCW and uh, in AACP um, to conduct interviews with families. Um, to um, gather the voices of those historically left out of the table um, and out of decision-making conversations. As a cohort, out of 75 local partnerships, about 30 of us, 30 of our, our members have come together and we work together to assess the level of family engagement and leadership that's happening, not only within their organization, but around the county. Um, they are learning together, training together. We provide technical assistance and that sort of peer networking um, and camaraderie and um, collaboration to sort of assess and then develop action plans. We have action plans within counties that are naming very specific ways that they are wanting to center uh, families. And it's amazing because um, in the first year that we kicked it off, we had um, about 
40 percent uh, families represented in some coalitions and some communities, 100 percent. Some of our local partnerships said we want all families leading this work. We are following their lead. So anywhere between 20 and 100 percent, we see families um, giving places and spaces at the table to really define the work that's shaping them right there in their community. Um, There's so many stories of um, our local partnerships engaging on this continuum. Um, we see not only that families, as I said, are navigators, they're consultants, they're advisors and practitioners. Um, we provoke, promote not only family-centered activities, but family-led. And um, I hope to really get into a little bit of that because they're both important. Um, and we believe that the impact of this engagement also exists on a continuum from program level impacts to countywide impacts and everything in between. So I'm really excited for the direction that our network is taking and the amount of momentum that's building to really center family voices and see it as a way of doing um, our work, um, see it as central, not an add-on, um, but an essential critical element that determines the successfulness and effectiveness of our work. Sophia, you've just given a lot of really great examples of what's possible when family voices are centered. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk first, and then I'll open this up to you too, Amanda and Twyla, you know, what is the risk if family voices are not centered? Well, I think um, there is a lot to be um, that a lot at risk. If our goal is that recipient families who advocate our recipient families are those who advocate for their children, then if we don't pay attention to family engagement minimally, we have fewer opportunities for families to engage. Um, ensuring that families have opportunities to engage in their ch child's development, um, the fewer opportunities for participating in those services and being recipients and being able to give feedback, um, the fewer opportunities we have for lived experiences um, at, uh, in, as part of our decision making. Um, I would say um, there are two things that I think are probably um, big things that are at stake. Um, obviously, you know, getting families engaged. Um, but first, I would say equity. Family engagement and leadership strategies are a tangible equity strategy. And if you are engaged in any part of the nonprofit sector, you, I'm sure you have heard the word equity, and it is a stated priority for many. Family engagement activities shift the power and they ensure that the voices most silenced are the voices at the center of decision making. So without this very concrete strategy, we literally are one less, um, you know, one less tool in our toolbox for achieving equitable solutions. Um, I have a couple other thoughts, but I want to hand it to my um, uh, partners on the panel for additional thoughts. So I'll jump in. Um, I agree with everything Sophia said, um, but I also want to add to that that, you know, the risk, even when we think we're doing it, still exists because what we think is engaging families may not be how families want to be engaged. So I'm going to say it again. What we think is engaging families might not be how families want to be engaged. So I've heard many times from folks that I've worked with that asking and listening is good, but responding and sharing back how something actually is going to play out or seeing some of those recommendations show up in programs, policies, interactions, right? When we don't do the whole circle, it ends up being you know, more harmful than good. So engaging and hearing from people is one thing, but bringing that back to the floor and saying, okay, this is what we learned and this is how we're going to do better. This is how we're going to make a difference is really, really like from what I've heard, again, from those who I've engaged, something that's really crucial and is oftentimes absent, particularly when programs um, are, are coming from academic environments. So I come from an academic environment and that was something I was trying to upset. Uh, and, and that's, you know, I'm hearing it still that many times when um, research is involved, folks don't hear back, you know, what did you do with the information that you gathered? And we all in nonprofit hear a lot about listening sessions and focus groups and things of that nature. But if, if people realize that nothing's changing, they're not gonna show up, right? So I think that's something else that is a, another layer of risk uh, when people aren't engaged in ways that are respectful. 
So respectful engagement, making sure that we've done our homework, right? If there's information that already exists,